On this Thursday night, you're probably familiar with the phone calls, scammers who claim to be tax officials telling you to pay up. Well, tonight we're on the hunt for the people on the other end of the phone in India, and we're confronting the police there and here about why nobody's trying to stop them. Exclusive coverage of the risks and how you can steer clear. Also tonight, the Commons is back for the last fall sitting before the next election as that NAFTA deadline looms. At issue is here. And on the one-year anniversary of Hurricane Maria, the White House congratulates itself on a job well done. But the people of Puerto Rico have a different view, and we traveled there to hear it. Why getting the number of the dead right is so important. This is The National. There's a good chance you've received one of those scam phone calls that sound official but are, in fact, frauds. Their only purpose? To steal your money. This message is intended to inform you regarding an enforcement action executed by the Canadian Revenue Agency intending your serious attention towards this matter. So some small clues. It's actually called the Canada Revenue Agency, and intending your serious attention isn't proper English. Ignoring this will be an intentional second attempt to avoid initial appearance before a magistrate judge, for a grand jury, for a federal criminal offense. In fact, Canada has no grand juries, but many victims presumably aren't noticing those mistakes. Our colleagues at CBC Marketplace spent months investigating this scam, and tonight you get the first look at their exclusive findings. Here's Marketplace host David Common. <laughs> The tentacles of this massive scam may reach to Canada, but it all starts here. Can you go inside the building now? One of Mumbai's sketchiest slums, and we're here because of a message you've probably heard. Canada Revenue Agency filed a lawsuit against your name. One of the largest cyber scams in Canadian history. There will be legal consequences and you will be arrested to defraud the government. Many of us just hang up here. Others will call back to confront the scammers. You are a journalist, right? Yes, I'm a journalist. Do you feel honest with your work? Yes. Yeah. You feel honest? Because this is not honest. No, 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 no. Do you, do you feel bad about what you do every day? Yes. Yeah. And many times every day, a Canadian falls for it. Why did you stay on the phone with him and not say, I need to hang up and, and call my accountant or do some research? Because I believe that he's trying to help me. Joe, as we're calling this man, handed over $36,000. When I realized I was so angry with myself. The scammers prey on seniors and immigrants, the most vulnerable and use technology like phone number spoofing to make it look like they're legitimate, or software which prevents a call from disconnecting. More than 60,000 Canadians have complained about being targeted, millions of dollars stolen. They lack empathy, they're brainwashed also. They're nothing but they're financial terrorists. <laughs> In India, we're getting help to find those scammers, and it takes weeks, but our investigation leads to this apartment building. We send an undercover team inside. Seconds later, though, they're being chased out. Yep. They followed us, like, for one and a half kilometer. So we came all the way in the small lanes, cutting the roads. To escape? To escape, yes. Our team believed the gang was armed. Indian police know about this scam, but to take action, they need to know about the victims. And says Police Commissioner Parambir Singh, the RCMP has never reached out. Nobody contacted us from Canada. You're telling me 60,000 people at least have complained in Canada sure. and nobody from Canada no, has told nobody you anything? Nobody contacted us. We asked the RCMP directly about the Indians' assertion. They did not offer an explanation, wouldn't talk on camera, but did send a statement saying fraud is a global problem and the best way to combat these types of crimes is through prevention and public awareness. It certainly is key, but even still, the calls keep coming. While in India, the police say they're ready to act, if only the Mounties would call and ask for help. 
And David Common joins us now in the studio. You mentioned spoofing. Why don't you explain what that is? So that, you look at your call display at home. They can make their phone number on your call display, first of all, look like it's coming from a Canadian number. And in some cases, they can actually make it look like it's coming from a legitimate Canada Revenue Agency phone number. That means you really can't trust your call display all the time. So there's a simple way, I guess, to make sure you're not vulnerable to this. Yeah, if you want to avoid becoming a victim, the Canada Revenue Agency will never begin a communication with you by phone. They will always send you a letter first. They will rarely call you. Good rule of thumb, if you weren't expecting the CRA to call, hang up. Simple as that. And uh, it's, it was a fascinating story. You're going to have a lot more tomorrow night on Marketplace. Thanks, David. Thank you. And Marketplace on tomorrow, 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television. And David will be live on Facebook to answer your questions tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. A year after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, how people are trying to bring attention to those who were killed. It won't be legal for dispensaries to sell pot in Ontario until at least April. So do these businesses shut down in order to go legit or take a chance and keep selling? But first, the World Anti-Doping Agency welcomes back Russia after a three-year ban. That ban was imposed after a report revealed extensive state-sponsored doping at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. At this year's Winter Olympics, Russian athletes were only allowed to compete under a neutral flag. Moscow has denied the allegations all along. And today, WADA, which is the main global body tasked with preventing doping in sport, says the country has sufficiently acknowledged its failures. It also agreed to hand over data and samples that could be used to corroborate potential doping violations. Reaction to WADA's decision was swift and angry from virtually everyone except the Russians. The CBC's Jamie Strachan has that story. Coming down the lane, she had a... Three-time Canadian Olympian Becky Scott knows what it's like to have a moment of athletic glory stolen. At the 2002 Olympics, the cross-country skier finished third behind two Russian skiers. Scott received the gold medal nearly two years later after the Russian skiers were banned for doping. Since retirement, she's been an advocate for clean sport, even becoming a member of WADA's compliance committee a position she resigned over the weekend after it became clear WADA was making concessions to Russia. The signatories to the code should be held to the same standard as athletes, and this is clearly uh, a breach of that. It's, politics have trumped principle. Canadian Olympic race walker Inaki Gomez shares Scott's concerns. This really brings their reputation to a, an, an all-time low and, and, and seriously it starts questioning the, the repute of, of the sport in general. Officials who drug test Canadian athletes are also angry. What Russia did, that's the biggest scandal in the history of sport. You know, Shoeless Joe Jackson, Pete Rose, forget about it. This thing is huge beyond all comprehension and yet WADA has caved in and rolled over to pressure from Russia and the IOC. The head of the American Anti-Doping Agency echoed Milia's concerns. We hold our athletes to zero tolerance, strict liability. We also have to hold states that compromise the very rules in, in violation of international treaties and sporting rules. They want to corrupt and, ro and rob clean athletes. Officials point out that in the wake of the Russian doping scandal, only two sports organizations, the IAAF and the International Paralympic Committee, actually banned Russian athletes. The IOC allowed most Russian athletes to compete in the last two Olympics. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Let's bring in the CBC's Chris Brown from Moscow. So Chris, give us a sense of how Russians are reacting to today's news. Well, I think Russia's strategy to essentially wait out the World Anti-Doping Agency worked. So today's decision here is really being greeted with a sense of both relief, but also a fair bit of vindication. Vladimir Putin's government hated that report done by Canadian Richard McLaren that concluded that the cheating and the doping that went on during the Sochi Games was largely state-sponsored. So uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't address that point. They waited, in fact, for three years and stalled until WADA was finally ready to accept something less than a full admission of guilt. The Russian government still has not 
publicly named or pinpointed uh, the individuals in government who it believes were responsible for the cheating, nor have they allowed access to independent investigators to the Russian labs or any of those dirty samples, although they will have to now uh, unless they want their compliance revoked. And what can we expect to happen next in this? Uh, well, crucially, this is good news for a lot of Russian athletes, particularly track and field athletes, who are hoping that they'll be able to be reinstated, not only competing overseas, but Russia will also be able to host competitions as well. Tonight on social media, we're seeing a lot of past and present Russian athletes uh, talking to each other uh, with a sense of vindication and also that they have triumphed over what they're calling hysteria from the West. Rosie. Chris, thanks for this. Appreciate it. A year ago today, Hurricane Maria slammed into the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. The wind was like a freight train, blowing 250 kilometers an hour. Some spots got half a meter of rain. It was the most powerful storm to hit the island in a century. And the damage estimate, about $100 billion. Ever since, the people who live there have been trying to put their lives back together in conditions that are still dangerous and, for some, hopeless. Yet today, the White House issued a glowing statement celebrating the signs of recovery. Calling it a historic recovery effort, the administration says it's made significant progress. It claims water systems have been restored for most of the island's three million residents and that thousands of kilometers of road that had been destroyed by cascading landslides and fallen trees have nearly all been repaired. It carries forward an often repeated presidential message. Well, I think Puerto Rico was uh, incredibly successful. But perhaps the starkest difference of perspective post Maria concerns the number of people who died. On that subject, the White House was silent today. And yet, as the CBC's Yuena Romiliotis explains, on the island itself, that number and the lives it represents are as important as the rebuild. In a place robbed of power for so long, counting the dead, naming them, gives some back. After Hurricane Maria, Manuel Gonzalez looked for his brother for six months. He finally found him in a morgue. He had been moved from one hospital to another, all in an attempt to find a place that could treat him. The cause of his brother's death, kidney failure. Supuestamente le dio dos faltos generales a través de los dial porque no se le podía dar diálisis y le dieron dos faltos generales. Lack of access to proper care is a huge factor behind the thousands of deaths related to Hurricane Maria, a death toll estimated to be as high as 9/11, but not nearly as recognized. And uh, we're going now to go to the second floor. Dignity for the dead. It's why Rafael Acevedo organized a memorial this past June. He asked people to bring a pair of shoes to mark the loved ones they had lost to the hurricane. The shoes are now stored in a community center in San Juan. Oh, my goodness. Yes. How many pairs of shoes? The, um, we, we got the, in the three days, we have 2,888 uh, pair of shoes. And more of them has messages testimonies, um, stories about people that, that, that die. For example, Michael Ferrer died 24 of September in Dr. Center Hospital. Why was, was that important for you to provide that space to allow people to do something as, as humble as leaving a pair of shoes? Because I think we needed that. Uh, I think when, when something like that happens, and then a lot of people are, have died, and um, the people uh, were very um, happy, uh, in a sense, of uh, having that opportunity. The memorial was an homage, but also a reprimand. Two independent studies estimate three to 4,000 people died in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. I think the, uh, the Trump administration has been cruel, uh, cynical, and, uh, and the um, amount of stupidity is unbelievable. 
The only word that, that Mr. Trump uses is fantastic. Everything is fantastic. And this is a fantastic uh, human calamity. FEMA, the U.S. Disaster Relief Agency, is committing more money to the recovery and recently acknowledged it was ill-equipped and overwhelmed in its initial response. The U.S. president's refusal to acknowledge those failures is an affront, many say, to those who died. People died. You can kill them with a gun or you can kill them with neglect. And the Trump administration um, didn't hear the things that we were saying. San Juan's mayor, Carmen Yulin Cruz, and her team are in the midst of preparing for this hurricane season. But a year after Hurricane Maria, she says accountability is the least the U.S. can offer. I think it's uh, very shameful that the director of FEMA just um, on the one hand says, oh, well, you know, we didn't do a good job. And the president of the United States continues to say that they did a fantastic job. But, but look, nobody can be fully prepared for a Category 4 with gusts of Category 5 hurricane. Um, but what we are all fully prepared for is to demand appropriate treatment and dignified treatment. Harsh lessons. There are countless here. Puerto Rico prepares for the next crisis while it still recovers and still counts the losses of the last one. Joanna Brumeliotis, CBC News, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And we are live tonight on The National, keeping tabs on a number of other developing stories, including reaction from Ticketmaster after a joint CBC News Toronto Star investigation that revealed this. I want to know the straight goods on whether Ticketmaster is going to be policing us using our multiple accounts. Uh, no. I have, I have a gentleman who's got over 200. Ticketmaster.com That was a Ticketmaster ref telling one of our reporters who is posing as a scalper that he could indeed use multiple accounts to snatch up large volumes of tickets. Our exclusive investigation also detailed a platform that helps scalpers resell those tickets, those seats rather. Today, Ticketmaster acknowledged that the use of multiple accounts to avoid ticket buying limits violates company policy and says it has launched an internal review. Also tonight, new details about the man behind this summer's deadly shooting rampage in Toronto's Greek town, but still no clear sense of motive for the attack. A police source told CBC News that searches of Faisal Hussein's computer and phone revealed no images linked to terrorism, but just released documents say Hussein did have mental health issues and several run-ins with police. Hussein killed two people and wounded 13 others before shooting himself in that July attack. As the Minister of Education, I would like to apologize for um, this offensive material for being um, appearing in a, an exam. And Alberta's Education Minister today, after outrage online over this multiple choice question, it appeared in an online social studies course asking students to pick the correct positive effect of Canada's residential schools. The Education Minister says his department is reviewing materials to make sure it doesn't appear again. And still ahead on The National, it's years behind schedule and billions of dollars over budget. We'll take you inside the Muskrat Falls Hydro Project. Plus, are Canadian and U.S. negotiators striking a different tone on NAFTA? Not a great one either. At issue is here to break it all down. And pot dispensaries in Ontario are being forced to make some tough decisions. So you can imagine that the dilemma for a black market dispensary operator who hears the Ontario government say, if you want to participate in the legal market, shut down now. October 17th, you may know that's when marijuana becomes legal across the country. But for people living in Ontario, there's another important date that's raising concerns. April 1st, the deadline the provincial government has given itself to introduce a private retail model. Meaning people can still buy it online, but they won't be able to get it in stores. And as Peter Armstrong explains, that's pushing illegal dispensaries into risky territory. The argument is pretty simple. Dispensaries like these are illegal. So shut them down and make way for the legal market. 
but things are rarely quite so cut and dry. I'm trying not to screw myself in the sense where I'm trying to go as legal as possible. Justin Loizos uses cannabis to treat his multiple sclerosis. Like his clients, he has a federal license to buy marijuana. He even has a business license to sell medical supplies. But in Canada, the only legal way to buy and sell cannabis is via the mail from licensed producers. He's always known this shop exists in a gray legal zone at best. I was just talking to my lawyer before, right. <laughs> and um, we're nervous. To go legal, he's been told to shut Dissident. down this operation Dissident. completely. THC. But that would mean abandoning his members. The majority of the people who are coming through here, the number one question on everybody's mind is, are we going to be OK? So for now, he's staying open, knowing the risks. Jeffrey Lazotte, a cannabis industry consultant, says it's a common dilemma. Some, he says, want to protect their clients, others to protect their profits. We hear reports from some people that make between twenty and $40,000 a day in revenue. So you can imagine that the dilemma for a black market dispensary operator who hears the Ontario government say, if you want to participate in the legal market, shut down now. Lazat says dispensary owners will face dramatically increased fines, but he says that's only going to do so much. I think the market is the most effective tool in displacing the black market. People aren't just going to leave their dealer who they've been buying pot off for 10 years. Tanya Siloom opened this Toronto shop at the height of the dispensary craze, but it wasn't long before police came knocking. So she's given up her lease and now attends city hall meetings and awaits Ontario's legal framework. Tanya's looking to get back in and this time go legit. We're ready to like do things, you know, the right way. And therein lies Ontario's challenge. Make that right way accessible to people like Tanya and Justin. Make it affordable, make it work. Otherwise, illegal dispensaries will always be part of the landscape. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. So that's the situation in Canada's largest city, but there's a patchwork of rules and approaches across the country. In Montreal, for example, police say distributing pot outside the Quebec Cannabis Society will be illegal, and they say they will be enforcing the rules. And in Vancouver, pot shops operating illegally now will only be legal after October 17th if they can get the proper licenses and permits. Still ahead on The National, Christia Freeland walks away from the negotiating table, not forever, but she didn't say when she'd be back. At issue talks about what that might mean for NAFTA. And our moment of the day, students across Toronto walking out of class to protest changes to the sex ed curriculum. We do not consent! We want to show the Ontario government that we do not consent to their actions. We do not consent to them changing and reverting to a 20-year-old curriculum. If there's a good deal to be had for Canada, which I think there is, then, then we, will, uh, we will look to sign it. They are in a position that's not a good position for Canada. Canada needs to really step up here this week. We're going to fight right down to the end. I chose my words carefully. Uh, today, we discussed some tough issues. Time is quickly running out. Canadian officials were back at the NAFTA negotiating table in Washington this week. Talks, though, have been described now as tense and slow. And some Americans, as you heard, there are expressing frustration with Canada. At issue is here to try and make sense of it all. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto tonight. And Eric Grenier is uh, nearby here in Ottawa. Good to see everybody. So let's start sort of there on that uh, Christia Freeland clip, which was from today. Chantal, I'll start with you. It did seem uh, that she was a little more restrained in, in her tone today, and there was no indication of when anybody is getting back to the table. How are you reading things from here? Well, I'm glad you're telling us that the clip is from today, because it could have been <laughs> from at some point last week or three weeks ago. Um, I was watching the reading the body language thing uh, on Christian Freeland, and I was reminded that when I was covering the constitutional negotiations, there would be weeks when everything was working towards a, a denouement, and weeks where it was an impasse. And in both cases, there was nothing very different happening. It was just a, 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 a to and fro. It's normal in a negotiation. I don't read very much from the pressure coming from the U.S. in the sense that the yeah. pressure 
uh, for a deadline there is uh, the midterm elections. There, uh, that's not a Canadian deadline. If the hopes was to put pressure on Canada or to find people to put pressure on, on Trudeau and his team to arrive at a quick deal, I'm not sure that's going to work. Yeah, I mean, I wondered, Andrew, whether though those people speaking out this week had not been mandated to do so by the, the head negotiator for the United States, which might be very skeptical of me or, or very true. I don't know how much that would be happening. Uh, skepticism is very much in order. Uh, I would only add two things. One is, uh, it is significant that these were coming from within the Congress, for a reason I'll yes. come back to in a second. And secondly, it wasn't just coming from the U.S. side of the border. You heard some noises this week from Canadian business uh, expressing some concern that maybe when the Prime Minister says uh, no deal is better than a bad deal, that he might actually mean it. Mm. Uh, and that they might mm. be prepared to let the deal, uh, uh, to let the talks fail, either just out of a, a hardline bargaining position or for the political benefits that might be gleaned from standing up to Donald Trump, et cetera. Now, yeah. there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, depending on the reasons why you let the talks fail. If you let the talks fail because in, in a... To, to prevent the U.S. from eliminating the dis dispute resolution mechanism, for example, then that's well and good. If it's to, just to save supply management, some of us would have a large, a large problem with that. <laughs> so it will depend on, on what the issues are that they're taking yeah. a, a hard line on. Yeah. But I think what's worrying the Canadian business is that we are placing our bets on the idea that the Congress, uh, when push comes to shove, will not ratify Trump's uh, attempt to go to a, a bilateral Canada, you know, U.S.-Mexico deal, yeah. and won't get rid of NAFTA when, if he asks them to do, do that. And that may or may not be a good bet, and that's what the significance of those noises coming from U.S. Congress. Well, and uh, go ahead, Chantal, I'll jump in. Yeah. No, two things, though. Uh, if if Canada w was about to sacrifice uh, a good deal, for instance, for the auto industry to salvage supply management. Uh, I suspect that uh, the union people who are around the table and who are still standing shoulder to shoulder with, with the Canadian government would say something about that. Uh, one of Mr. Trudeau's biggest critic in this country, the Premier of Ontario, went to see for himself and seemed to be satisfied that uh, no one was playing games uh. that he couldn't live with. So uh, until I see some evidence that the Canadian negotiating team and the wide sense of the word is starting to shoot at each other. I'm mm -hmm. not going to see that as anything other than pressure tactics. Plus, the calendar, uh, whatever people may say about Congress, that is totally true, except if you're going to give the notice that you want to pull out of NAFTA and you're Donald Trump, you're not going to have a Congress around to do anything about it pretty much until next year at this point. Okay, Eric, you weigh in there in terms of how you see maybe the, the, the deadline approaching rapidly without, I mean, we don't really know, but it doesn't seem as though we're closer to, to a deal at this, at this stage anyway. Well, in terms of the political fallout of it, we know that uh, Canadians don't like Donald Trump. There was a poll out just today from Abacus Data. 80% of Canadians have a negative opinion of him, just 9% a positive one. So if they don't get a deal out of this, I think that a lot of Canadians are likely to put the blame on Donald Trump rather than uh, Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland, at least yeah. in the short term. Uh, of course, in the longer term, if the deadline for the federal Liberals is really the next election in terms of uh, what the impact of this will be, if the economy is hurting from whatever comes out of these negotiations, uh, even if uh, now how people might blame Donald Trump rather than Justin Trudeau. If the economy is hurting, the government is likely to wear that uh, next October. So what if um, what if the, we don't make the deadline here? Uh, play the what, what if game with me. If you, <laughs> well, what, a, is, what is the deadline? Well, the, the, who, who says there is a firm deadline? The deadline that they are working with is the end of the month, all right? So let's yes, take them but, at their words. But does if we <laughs> miss that deadline, though, all right, and they say they're going to go ahead with Mexico, does it then uh, become more difficult for us to get back in? That's that's what I want to know. It's Sunshine. very difficult for them to go ahead. I, I'm not going to become a, an expert at this, but I do understand that it's very difficult logistically for them to go ahead with Mexico within a short time frame. Yeah. And, and as I say, they would have to get the Congress to sign off on it, and it's an open question, to say the least, whether the Congress would. Uh, I do agree with Chantel that, uh, you know, deadlines here are basically made to be broken. Uh, there's sure. no particular uh, drop-dead date, really, for any of this. Uh, and there's some, uh, a strong case, I think, for the, from the Canadian perspective, to stall, to, to run out the clock, and to wait until after the midterms. Uh, the, the, the biggest single factor here is Trump and the degree to which Trump can kind of have his way here. And he grows weaker by the day uh, as all these different forces close in on the United States, including the Mueller inquiry. And if, in fact, you get a Democratic Congress out of that that controls the committees and can call, call witnesses and really hold them to account, 
then that's, I think, worth waiting, even if you get a more, slightly more protectionist but, Congress. But, you're not, of, but you're, not su you're not suggesting that that's the strategy. I, I don't know whether it is right. or not. I think, it's a, I think it's a strategy worth pursuing, and it may be the strategy we're pursuing. I don't know. Okay, I want to shift gears to this week because everybody came back uh, here to the to their office jobs, not their writing jobs. And uh, with it came a bit of a surprise. Take a listen to this. I announced today that I am withdrawing from the government benches to take my seat among my Conservative colleagues. She is ready to work hard as a member of a strong and united Conservative team. So I don't want to overblow this because I'm not sure that that story lasted more than a day and a half. But Eric, <laughs> give us a sense of how that kind of thing can impact momentum, story, what we might see in the, in the coming weeks. Well, in, in terms of Monday when that happened, I think it, it may, made sure that we were talking about a gain for the Conservative Party and not the fact that they had just lost Maxim Bernier, who had launched the People's Party uh, the preceding Friday. So no one was talking about Maxim Bernier anymore. And Andrew Scheer was able to make the case that, look at him, he is uniting Conservatives uh, from across the spectrum, uh, r rather than having to answer questions about why uh, a new party is splintering off. Uh, from the Conservatives. But, you know, he did win that day, and as you said, uh, we stopped talking about it really uh, very quickly afterwards. So it's about whether he can continue to keep winning days up until next year. Andrew. Uh, I think this will be ne not necessarily remembered too much in the, into the future. Uh, just to pick up a point that Eric was making, uh, we're going to get into issues, I think, where, uh, and the Liberals may, may play this to their advantage, where they bring forward questions that uh, the traditional Conservative Party will have a hard time opposing and where Maxime Bernier will be only too delighted to oppose them. Mm. And so there can be some fissures and some, some uh, tensions that can be opened up there. But certainly on the day and in the week, uh, it did uh, hurt any chance of the Liberals trying to claim momentum. It get, did get people talking. I think the most damaging thing is the degree to which this might crystallize for center-right Liberals, for so-called blue Liberals, the degree to which this government has really left them behind. This is not a government in which there's really a lot of place for uh, the, the so-called blue Liberals. And uh, in this case, the MP in question, I think, fit that description. Chantal, uh, and our, may, yeah, go ahead. No, but maybe she did fit that description, but the, uh, it was a, a damaging, a lasting damage uh, to a governing party from losing someone is usually over an issue that people can identify. Yes. And the fact that she couldn't come up with one uh, means that, yes, you win a day, but where do you win it, on Parliament Hill or, or in the larger country? If, if Justin Trudeau had lost an MP from BC over his decision to buy a pipeline, yes. or one from Alberta over what's happened in court over the Trans Mountain pipeline, that would have had more legs than an MP who lives in an area where the Conservatives have done well in the past in elections, uh, deciding a month after having said nice things about the Prime Minister uh, that she can't bear it anymore. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. If you're going to quit a party, there better be something very specific to complain about, which I think she she was lacking. And when we did those sort of histories of floor crossers, I had actually forgot all about Eve, Eve Adams crossing the floor. So I mean, that goes to show you how quickly those stories last. They don't actually last that long. Eric, you've been looking at some of the latest poll numbers for for the parties, as you do. Um, are we seeing any shifts in these early days? Uh, well, we have seen some shifts over the last few months, and I think we can look at the numbers with that. We've seen that things are more or less returning to where they were in 2015, uh, yeah. because if we go back about six months ago, we had the Conservatives and the Liberals more or less in a tie, uh, but since then, the Liberals have pulled back to about 39 percent, the Conservatives somewhere around 33. A uh, problem for the Conservatives it might also be that the New Democrats are down to 16 percent. Uh, Jagmeet Singh has not been able to break through very well, so the Liberals are more or less starting where they, t where they began the, uh, their mandate, uh, which is not a bad position for the Conservatives, that they're still within striking distance, they're still raising a lot of money. Uh, if these are still the numbers going into next summer, I don't think the Conservatives would be particularly upset because they could work with those numbers. Andrew? Uh, the Liberals have got a, a hard year ahead of them in terms of they've got the pipeline, they've got the carbon pricing, they've got NAFTA, all these issues that are going to be very difficult for them. So on that side, you say they're, they're in, a, in a tough spot. But a weak NDP and Conservatives yeah. fighting amongst yeah. themselves more than compensates for that at this point. Chantal, last word to you. Uh, uh, and also, uh, difficult relations with a polarizing conservative Ontario premier uh, should actually work to uh, Justin Trudeau's advantage, especially if you combine it with uh, the weakness of the NDP. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to see uh, how they pull themselves out of, of the rut that they are in at this point. Okay.
We'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Eric, good of you to join us this week. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to our At Issue podcast edition. You'll get some extra content this week. We're talking about the upcoming provincial elections in New Brunswick and Quebec. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And still ahead here on the program, meet the crew trying to salvage the multi-billion dollar Muskrat Falls hydro project. Somebody appeared to take command of the Titanic after she hit the iceberg. Tonight on The National, we are watching for more details out of Tanzania after a ferry carrying hundreds of people sank just meters from a dock on the country's Lake Victoria. So far, we know at least 44 people drowned, but one official told Reuters the number of dead could climb to 200 when the search resumes tomorrow. The cause still under investigation. There have been discussions amongst the parties, and if you seek it, I think you'll find unanimous consent for the following motion. Recognize that these crimes against the Rohingya constitute genocide. MPs in the House of Commons today unanimously recognizing the killings of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar constitute genocide. And not only that, Parliament also endorsed a call by the United Nations to investigate and prosecute senior members of Myanmar's military for their roles in the atrocities. It all follows a scathing report released last month. The UN saying it had found evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Okay, let's turn our attention back to this country. Public hearings have begun into a controversial hydroelectric development in Labrador. The Muskrat Falls project is years behind schedule, billions over budget, and it's been described by critics as a threat to the province's financial future. Well, CBC News got a rare tour of the project from the man who was brought in to salvage it. In this exclusive report, Chris O'Neill Yates spells out what's at stake, not just for Newfoundland and Labrador, but for the entire country. How we doing, boy? How you doing? How are you doing? Good to talk to you, boys. What the hell are you trying to do here now? Trying to pull these pipes up, sir. No, pull the pipes up, yeah. Keep, keep in good shape, though. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> First, you got to lug them around, too. Are you right? <laughs> Stan Marshall's mood isn't dampened by the enormity of his job. Salvaging a multi billion dollar project he once called a boondoggle. Somebody appeared to take command of the Titanic after she hit the iceberg. And this is Marshall's Titanic, the Muskrat Falls hydro project on the Churchill River in Labrador. The largest hydro project under construction in Canada right now. Estimated cost, just over $6 billion. Current projection with interest, almost $13 billion and counting. Standing high above the dam slipway, Marshall sees money literally spilling away. Interest cost is $1 million a day, but every day we're spilling all this water. Good, going good? Going very good. Yeah. Yep. Good weather yeah. for, uh, for RCC. Yeah, I, I'm a bit surprised. I, th I thought the rain would maybe interfere with you a bit. Nope, that's good. Yeah. Marshall yep. is a career utility executive, Still having built hydro projects around the world. Yeah, Local boy yeah. makes yeah. good. While he can't raise the Titanic, he was brought in to right this ship and get it finished. And this is where they converge, going into control zone. When we're finished here, we're going to go over there. And if he'd been there in the beginning, he says he never would have built this. Absolutely not. The risks are just too great. A big project of this magnitude relative to the size of the owner and the risks it entails, building something three times, I never would have done this. When the project was approved, the idea was for Muskrat Falls to generate clean, green energy and replace an outdated power plant. The project would create affordable energy, attract industry that would provide jobs. To pay for the project, consumers would pay more to heat their homes. And part of the cost would be offset by selling surplus power to an energy-hungry continent. Instead, the anticipated energy demand and price plummeted. To sit down and try to do analysis based on projections of energy prices for 40 years, I mean, you know you're going to be wrong. The province turned to Ottawa for help, and two federal governments provided loan guarantees of $8 billion. Former Provincial Deputy Minister Ron Penny thought Muskrat Falls was a bad idea from the start. It's a fact that the taxpayers in Newfoundland are not going to be able to afford to pay for this. So it's going to be on the backs of the taxpayers 
of Canada. You want to call your first witness then, Mr. Lerma? If the inquiry finds problems, no one will ever be held to account. It has no power to do that, despite the $33 million price tag. On this day, the people of our province are realizing a dream that some thought would never be possible. As Premier, Danny Williams championed this project. Today, he's as adamant as ever that Muskrat Falls is good for Newfoundland and Labrador and says all mega projects have cost overruns. Would you have gone ahead with this on your own money? I made that statement before and I was asked that question some time ago. My answer then was yes, and my answer now is yes. We have a project that is, unlike an oil project which is depleted, it's renewable, the water will flow forever. But it'll never undo the fact that you built something bigger than you needed and you paid for it dearly. Generators, Generators on top of that. Top of that. Yeah. So all this part is below water, of course, and it's captured the energy. But the power won't be flowing for two more years. Overlooking the giant powerhouse where those generators will go, Marshall watches as still ever more rebar is secured. Another day, another million dollars in interest. See the hole way down there? That's where the water will come in from the bottom of the reservoir and go into the uh, tubes where the turbines will be. We're going to go all the way down here. Come over here, Eddie. You can see a better picture down here. And by showing us around this massive project today, Marshall wants to make sure the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and Canada get a better picture of what he's trying to accomplish. We can do nothing but the past, but the people will remember how you finish, and I want us to finish strong, and they're doing that. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Muskrat Falls, Labrador. Tomorrow night on The National, a Nova Scotia community is taking a new approach to managing stormwater by bringing a river back to the surface half a century after it was buried and forgotten. 1971, we had Hurricane Beth roared through Dartmouth and a pile of damage flooded a bunch of homes, took the bowling pins right out of the bowling alley and they floated off down the street. And so after that, you know, it was kind of the best thinking of the time was, well, we need to control this river. So they put it into a pipe and buried it underground, and it was the river that everyone forgot about until about you know, three or four years ago. We, we tread so heavy on the landscape as human beings. This is a small thing, but it's one small thing we, we've done here in Dartmouth to, to kind of fix something that we broke right back in the 1970s. Today, a number of Ontario high school students walked out of classes to protest the rollback of an updated sexual education curriculum, which covered subjects like consent and sexting. Organizers say that tomorrow, as many as 40,000 students could follow suit. So today's warm-up is our moment of the day. We want to show the Ontario government that we do not consent to their actions. I originally did live under the old curriculum and it was missing a lot of different things. Consent, same-sex marriage, gender identity, and online bullying and sexting. These are issues that often with students, it can be a matter of life or death. We do not consent! The teachers and principal have been enormously supportive. They've even moved major tests and assignments from Friday to the following Monday so that the students could successfully walk out and have no consequences. So some of these kids are, they say, are doing this for their brothers or their sisters, their siblings who are coming along and won't have had any of this education. And you, no matter what your position is on, on whether this is the right move or not, I'm just impressed when high school students, I don't know about you, get this engaged in, in their own education and speak out about how they feel. I think... I, I didn't do things like that, so that's very impressive to me. You, you know what? I, of course, I was in school a whole generation before you, yeah. Rosie, but I was going to make exactly the same point. And so I think part of the civics lesson will be to see how things go. We should check yeah. back with them in totally. 30, 40 days and see if they still have that zeal. Yeah. And I guess you were in school in two generations before me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but fair, fair point. I mean, there's the protests, yeah. right? But there's also, I mean, fundraisers, uh, discussions that they're going to be having. It's yeah. not simply, you know, one afternoon where they'll go out and, and wave some signs. There's more to it, which is, uh, I suppose, makes it all the more impressive. That is okay. The National for this September 20th. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night, kid. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>